Hey, podcast fans, this is Chris Webster, founder of the APN, and I just want to thank you for downloading this episode. Please consider becoming a member of the APN if you're not already and helping us make more great shows and get them out to the world. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash members or click the link in the show notes. On to the show. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 189. I'm your host, Chris Webster. My co-host, Paul Zimmerman, is off in the Middle East again. Today, we discuss using human remains, sensing dogs, and other subsurface techniques to find a historic cemetery in Louisiana with Zach Overfield from HDR. Let's get to it. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. Today, it is just me. Paul is out in the Middle East doing some fantastic things, and... I'm sure he will come on and tell us all about it when he gets back in a few weeks. So we can look forward to that probably later in November. This is our first new episode in a little while. We had a little break over October, and that helped us kind of retool some of the things we're doing at the Archaeology Podcast Network and for all the other shows. And now we're back at it. So with that, we're going to start with an interview. And I'd like to welcome Zach Overfield from HDR. Zach, how's it going? Pretty good, Chris. Really excited to be here. Awesome. So I was actually approached by your company to talk about this project that we're going to talk about, which I think is a first for definitely the Archaeotech podcast and probably all of the Archaeology Podcast Network. And it's first off, I just like to say it's fantastic that that's happened because it's always been uh, somewhat of a, a goal of mine with the Archaeology Podcast Network since I founded it to be an outlet for CRM companies to talk about these projects outside of like a paper that let's be honest, very few people are actually going to read and a CRM report, which even fewer people are going to read. And it's just, you know, these cool things, they just never get out there in the way that we would like it. So, you know, our several thousand listeners a month would be happy to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that HDR is the first and I hope other companies do the same thing. Cause you know, I agree. You know, so much of what we do doesn't go beyond, you know, a small uh, group of professionals. And sometimes um, it's dubious whether even our clients, you know, read the reports. Um, (laughs) So I think it's really important for archaeologists to be getting out and trying to disseminate our work to a larger audience and, you know, hopefully just make what we do more accessible in general. And that's what I love so much about about your podcast. Yeah, there's a lot of great information and it's and it's easy to get to so which is pretty much the opposite from from most archaeological (laughs) technical work exactly exactly yeah for clients it's always make sure that executive summary is real good because they'll probably read that you know but (laughs) (laughs) the first few paragraphs look real sharp (laughs) exactly exactly all right well let's just set the stage here so you're working in louisiana tell us a little bit about this project how did it come about this is a crm project so what prompted this this action this section 106 action and then we'll get into what it is a little bit yeah so i just recently rejoined hdr like a little over a year ago and day three of like onboarding i haven't even finished like my corporate training yet i got pulled into (laughs) this this project you know i've done some cemetery investigations in my career and you know this was kind of had just been spooling up and it's a it's for a freight rail project it, mm-hmm. just upriver from New Orleans near a small town called Norco, Louisiana, and it's located within the Bonacare Spillway, which is a very large Corps of Engineers uh, civil works project, you know, for flood control from the Mississippi into Lake Pontchartrain. And Canadian National, our client, who in this area operates mm-hmm. as Illinois Central Railroad, this bri- this okay. wooden trestle bridge, you know, needed to be rebuilt because dated to the 1930s, so. One, we had to, you know, architectural our architectural historians had to assess whether or not the bridge itself was a historic property. Mm. But you know, during the early project planning phases, there it it wasn't assumed that a lot of archaeology would have to be done because in in the eighties the core had had this area surveyed extensively. And so pretty much a hundred percent of it was covered by some level of effort uh, in the past. And then they've been actively sand mining in this spillway and they're they're still doing it they're even doing it when we were out there eventually doing the field work okay and so the early you know environmental project manager and and client thinking was that archaeology wasn't going to be a concern and it was going to be a pretty smooth environmental permitting process 
that ended up not being the case <laughs> during the <laughs> during the core uh, pre-application meeting. Core archaeologist, you know, very casually just brought up that you know it's come to his attention that there, there may be a Union Cemetery in the spillway and potentially you know within the project area. Well, no big deal. This was like, no big deal. Um, <laughs> and this was before this, this had happened like soon, just a little bit before I started. And so I basically got pulled into call number two with the core where they were already kind of expecting a, a scope of work from us and a, and a research design. But, you know, there was still a need for like a lot of clarification on HDR's end on like, okay, where's this information coming from? Because our, you know, due diligence and desktop research hadn't resulted in identifying anything like that. But basically what he said was that, you know, just local information had been passed to him that in, mm-hmm. during that, that early work, when the spillway was being surveyed, that a, there was a, a, a gentleman who had passed along some oral history and this, this man was in his late 80s, and he was passing along something his grandfather had told him as a child. Okay. Was that there was a Union Cemetery near the the bridge, the, the CN Bridge. Huh. And this was information he was relaying, you know, this was, he was recounting it in the 80s for something that had transpired in his childhood, you know, decades yeah. before that. And then there was one historic photograph of just an like anonymous looking, uh, looking cemetery but on the back, it had scrawled in pencil, Bonacare Sem. Hmm. Now, there are several cemeteries in what is today the Bonacare Spillway. So whether or not <laughs> this photograph is of this Union Cemetery is is suspect. And still, the present day, I'm, I'm pretty unsure that that's a photo of this cemetery. Sure. Because a lot of archival research we ended up doing, it seems like the cemetery didn't have headstones, and this photograph clearly is a, of a cemetery with headstones. So, seems okay. <laughs> suspect. So, you know, we started basically at that point. We were told by the Corps that we'd have to do an archaeological investigation, and so, you know, we kind of started that that usual process, and we were uh, pulling together a plan uh, to do a mechanical prospection. It was kind of plan mm-hmm. number one. So, you know, that's that's basically kind of how things kicked off you know stand and starting as a standard 106 sure. process and you know there's also a lot of other environmental permitting needed because we were operating in the spillway so and in this part of louisiana get permits from the office of coastal management so even to to just to dig a hole in the spillway you need a permit from the from the core whether it's archaeology or or not um, it's a sure. core civil works sure. project so it's section section 408 you know the real estate action and all that all that stuff i mean back up a little bit did the bridge end up being historic itself great question so just north also in the spillway closer to lake poncha train is an even longer 1930s wooden trestle bridge <laughs> That HDR okay. was and Canadian. Na- it's also Canadian National Bridge, and so mm-hmm. HDR had just been working with Canadian National on on that bridge, and that one was evaluated as eligible as just a, a, basically a tremendous engineering feat for the time. Sure, just uh, revolutionized 1930s wooden trestle bridge engineering. That's just cool. crossing basically, you know, this massive this massive area. So basically because of that bridge, because that bridge was eligible, this one is much smaller. Mm-hmm. So our analysis that the, the core ended up and the SHPO ended up agreeing with that, that basically this one, you know, almost in light of the other one, basically that this one being much shorter and, and pretty redundant with the other one, not eligible. And it was constructed later. Okay. So this much longer one constructed first. That's the important one. This one constructed later is determined not eligible. Yeah. Clearly, I'm not an architectural historian, but I think that probably <laughs> <laughs> hits the yeah. nail on the head. I'm actually a little curious about the other bridge, too. It, it, did they just yeah. kind of beef that one up a little bit and, and restore it a little? Or, you know, I mean, if it's if it's still in use and getting old, you got to do something with yeah. it. No. So actually, so like you said, so I mean, these are quite old, almost 100 year old bridges, right? And sure. And they yeah. were in frequent use with very heavy freight trains <laughs> crossing them. Right. So, you know, that one still had to be reconstructed. So it did, you know, there was a, an MOA developed, there was, you know, m- mitigation for it. So mm-hmm. 
uh, in interpretive signage uh, primarily, in addition to like your hair documentation. Sure. So on the spillway, there will be, they haven't been installed yet, but they've been uh, created like this, that bridge, the new bridge for that project is like currently in construction and like wrapping up, you know, this year. So okay. there'll be some interpretive signage installed and there was all the uh, documentation done. But yeah, that one is being deconstructed and, and rebuilt. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. All right. So we've got a little bit of the backstory now. Now on to the archaeology of the whole thing. In the write-up that you sent us, it was mentioned that a suggestion was made in order to help find the cemetery to basically just dig up the whole thing, right? I mean, mm-hmm. archaeologists have shovels and they love to use them. So yep. you guys didn't end up doing that. But what was the what was the discussion around why you didn't end up doing that? You know, why, why a full-scale excavation didn't initially take place? Or, or really, other other testing and shovel testing as well presumably would happen before that. But yeah. Well, yeah. So, from a shovel testing standpoint, there's just no way you could reach, you know, any any sort of deposit. Oh, that just tell you anything. too deep. You know. Yeah. One going to be too deep, and two, you're just in this. So we're in the the spill the spillway, which is like an extensive yeah. wetland environment. You know, in South uh, Louisiana, right. just upriver from New Orleans. So. Water table was a major concern for sure for a number of reasons. But basically, you know, the first thing, you know, we got the requirement from the core and we put together like a pretty standard sample, like mechanical scraping sample. Mm -hmm. And we were going to look at just a portion um, of the, the project area. And it was still like a pretty, uh, pretty large scale effort. You know, our the costs for us, you know, for the sample were in the, was in the six figures, and sure. obviously the client was having a lot of heartburn about th- about that. Mm-hmm. But you know, what what must be done must be done. And so, you know, my initial thinking was it was a pretty commiserate sample in regards to just like the potential impacts because these wooden trestle bridges, you know, the new bridge. The footprint of the the pilings is super minimal. I mean, the total like project area subsurface impact was like 0.01 acres because Jeez. just add <laughs> just cumulatively adding up just the footprint of the pilings. Yeah, and they're they're driven pile right. So a giant machine goes along just driving these straight in the ground so that there there's not large scale excavation. And Mm -hmm. the sampling strategy that we are proposing was going to be way more excavation than even the project, you know? Yeah. So I was like, so it seemed reasonable to me. I submitted it to the core, core passed it along to the Louisiana Division of Archaeology. And the state archaeologist felt that because of the Louisiana unmarked historic burials law, that really Mm -hmm. the entire project needed to be excavated. Mm -hmm. Because under that state level law, you know, no new development, you know, can be done on top of a cemetery. For sure. So it really kind of changed. Well, their perspective is like, you know, they understood how kind of minimal the footprint was, but just under Louisiana state law to protect cemeteries, you know, their initial feeling was that you need to, we need to scrape it all. And then, you know, that was going to, you know, at a minimum, like quadruple the cost of what we had already proposed, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, at a minimum. And that's not even taking into account, like we would need to have the contractor doing the the trenching was going to have to have a significant presence and also lots of shoring available because we're op- like I was saying in the environment we were operating in with a shallow water table and we'd be talking about really unstable soils, the flood you know, pretty quickly and need to be pumped out to even examine the trench profiles for burial shafts. Hmm. So it seemed like a logistics nightmare from, from jump street and, you know, freight railroad clients are extremely safety conscious. And so, you know, they, yeah. they were just kind of really unsure that this could really even be, be done in a, <laughs> a manner that they would find safe and, you know, in addition to our costs, which just for the sample were already six figures, the con like the contractor's costs, which was going to be a sub consultant directly to the cl- to the client to our client, was also considerable. Mm-hmm. And so, just like basically quadrupling that amount of work or more w- was yeah. pretty eye popping for them. So, you know, we we're going back and forth with like the level of effort with the division of archaeology, and you know. 
it seemed like we could maybe scale it back a little bit and not do a hundred percent and really just like hone Mm -hmm. in on the new, the new piling locations or, or at least scale it back some, but it was still going to be a pretty dramatic expansion of what we initially proposed and logistically challenging. So during that time when we were just kind of looking for alternatives or, or trying to adjust our, our scope, you know, I've been made aware of, you know, some work that had been done primarily in academic circles, you know, using the historic human remains detection dogs uh, Mm -hmm. and other remote sensing techniques to, to look for, for burials. And, you know, I had just like a passing awareness of it, but right around the time that we were going back and forth on the scope with, uh, with the core and the division of archeology, span a Dr. Ben Alexander with Texas state, actually not far from where you're posted up right now in Austin <laughs> was giving a present, a virtual presentation to the North Texas archeological society, which I virtually attended talking about these applications in archeology span and work that he had done mm-hmm. like for text dot for, you know, Section 106 and Antiquities Code of Texas compliance. And during his presentation, you know, I, you know, interrupted like several times asking questions. Uh, he <laughs> said we could ask questions during. So I did. Um, and I was like, do you think you, they would work in a really wet environment, potentially, you know, upriver from New Orleans, Louisiana? And, uh, you know, the more we got into the details, I was like, this, this seems like a viable approach to me. So I was like texting like the project manager, like while I was still like watching this presentation. Um, yeah. And it ended up talking to Dr. Alexander or immediately after the presentation. And it seemed like, you know, something he was worth, you know, interested in, in exploring because he was looking to get his his specially trained dogs into some different environments, you know, and really you know, get some additional visibility like for this work. And I was like, all right, okay. well, you know, we'll start start exploring this. And you know, he has some other contacts like in this in this business, in in the dog business. So I started getting the ball rolling with the agencies, which in and of itself was a, a pretty big feet um, <laughs> to get approval from the agencies. So, Right. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good point to take a break and we'll come back and see how that went and the other subsurface sensing equipment that you used to actually find or not find, as the case may be, this, uh, this cemetery. So let's do that on the other side of the break. Back in a minute. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? outsourcing business tasks you hate. What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. Welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 189. And I'm talking to Zach Overfield about the project he was on with HDR, where working to try to find the existence or non-existence of potentially a Civil War era cemetery. So... At the end of the last segment, you mentioned hearing about these cadaver dogs, as I've come to know them. We've actually done episodes with the, I can't remember if it was on this show or another show on the APN, but definitely talked to some of the people that operate a cadaver dog company out of California. And they've, they've been on fires and archaeological projects and all kinds of stuff. I remember 
I mean, crazy things these dogs can find, right? I remember one of the yeah. big fires in California, I think the Paradise Fire, I think they called that the campfire, but Paradise, California burned down and somebody contacted them because they had sitting on the mantle of their house, which literally burned to the ground. I mean, there was nothing left to this house. It just raged through their big house, burned completely to the ground. But the ashes of one of their deceased parents was sitting on the mantle of the fireplace and there was a good foot thick of ash just where the house used to be and the cadaver dogs found the ashes of the um, person i I couldn't even believe it i didn't know they could find ashes i know they could find remains and that has definitely an odor that dogs can pick up but ashes right so well, you know, yeah. with these dogs, it goes even beyond ashes, right? Because with ashes, mm-hmm. at least there's something like physical there. Um, sure. But these dogs, you know, and the why, why I say historical human remains detection dogs and like differentiate that from from like like broader category of cadaver dogs is because these dogs that we are working with and the dogs, you know, that are really built for this work are specifically trained to identify human remains that are 75 years or older. And really what they're trained on is to identify the the odor of human decomposition, right? So uh, yeah. they're looking for areas where, where human remains were. So there doesn't necessarily have to be anything left of the body. So, you know, with ashes, like, you know, I, I think I could certainly believe that because they, at least there's something there, but these dogs, you know, can find, or basically everything else is decom- decomposed away. Um, and there mm-hmm. might be nothing physical left of, of the human body. And they can also differentiate between humans and other mammals, which, which still blows my mind. And we don't actually a hundred percent understand how they do that even. Wow. That's yeah. yeah. Which is really interesting. And, yeah, so these dogs, you know, I, I started talking to Ben Alexander and then ended up working with him and uh, Paul Martin of Martin Archaeology Consulting, who is working on his dissertation right now on this very topic and has his own trained dog and, you know, other remote sensing equipment. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we relied pretty pretty heavily on, on Paul and, and Ben for their expert guidance and their, like I said, their dog, you know, Ben has trained, he's basically the, uh, the dog trainer at uh, Texas State for their for the fact, their, their forensic anthropology center. Okay. So he's trained lots of different like cadaver dogs. And this dog in particular that we worked with, her name was Rip. Um, R.I.P. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's been trained from a puppy to, to find, you know, old human remains and, and right barely there fragments and and so and same thing with with paul's dog so one thing that ben really stresses is that just you know not all not all dogs are necessarily cut out for this work and that each cadaver you know cadaver dogs have different strengths and some dogs are much better at finding remains on the surface right sure Um, but some dogs are uniquely talented in in finding just the human scent or you know deeply buried remains and they've also had mm-hmm. success uh, identifying remains um, that are underwater so they take these dogs Jeez. out on boats on boats and that's nuts through a combination yeah through a combination of <laughs> the dogs and you know marine remote sensing techniques have been able to identify human remains mm-hmm. so, so their capability is, is truly incredible and i always uh, kind of meet some initial like skepticism when I talk to people about this, because since I got involved with this project, well, one for the project, I just had to get buried deep in this literature, you know, but I've also at this point given a couple presentations about it. I'm set to give another one in November about this project in particular. Mm-hmm. Either people are really fascinated and just blown away by how, how good the dogs are, or they have a lot of skepticism. Well, yeah, but yeah, but the canine olfactory system is just incredibly powerful and they perceive the world entirely different than we do. Uh, so along those are, lines, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, there, I mean, there, there's obviously dogs that can detect like cancer and other illnesses as well. Not just, uh, right. you know, not just cadavers and stuff. I mean, it's insane yeah. what their, what their noses and their olfactory system can do. But so, Along these lines, like you mentioned, people are either amazed or highly skeptical. How did you convince the Louisiana Division of Archaeology and the Army Corps that 
using these dogs would actually satisfy the laws and regulations around what you're supposed to do. Because archaeologists, you know, you give us a shovel or a trowel and we just love to dig stuff up. And it's really the only thing we believe 100 <laughs> percent. So yeah. how did you, how'd still, you convince them this would work? <laughs> you know, and that and I so that was definitely the, the case. Right. Because that was the, the initial <laughs> ask was dig an extremely big hole. Right. Mm hmm. So, you know, at first I, we, t- we approach, well, once, once I had the client convinced, you know, then I was like, all right, now we have to talk to the agencies. So I was like, you know, just like one uh, gate at a time, basically. And sure. from the, from the client's perspective, you know, they were, like I said, a little skeptical that the agencies were going to approve this, but they were willing to basically, you know, they were definitely supportive of, of giving it a shot. I mean, honestly, the thing they're most concerned about was just like the logistics and safety of, of digging up so much of the right of way. Sure. So, you know, this was a potentially uh, bladeless option. And so talking to the core, basically kind of their default was, yeah, you know, they read up. I sent them tons of literature. So I sent them like a share, mm-hmm. you know, point a link where they could download all the references that I had been reviewing, basically. Yeah, and then we had a technical call with uh, Ben Alexander. You know, they got on board pretty quick, but they're basically like, "Well, you know, we'll defer to whatever the Division of Archaeology says." And uh, I don't know if you've ever worked in Louisiana, Chris. It's one of the few states I haven't. Yeah, yes, Doctor Chip McGimsey has been a, a mainstay in Louisiana for a while, and is a he's a, a force in uh, southeastern archaeology. And uh, I would say most people working in this part of the country are pretty deferential to him. So basically, the, the core's sure. you know conclusion was like, if, if Chip if Chip says it's good, you know, we're, you'll be good. And so that was the real the real task. So we got a call together, you know, multiple calls really, but with Chip and yeah, they'd actually. So I talked to him about the technique, and he was familiar. But they'd actually uh, done this kind of work at Poverty Point in northeastern Louisiana, which is okay. uh, you know, pre-agricultural mound site. Um, it's mm-hmm. the only UNESCO World Heritage Site in Louisiana, and one of the few in the South in general. And they had just they had just used these type of dogs, and so he was familiar with it, and you know, he had si- signed off on that for Poverty Point. So he wasn't really super skeptical of the the methodology, but he was uncertain from just a legal standpoint of whether it was going to be acceptable for 106 compliance and Louisiana unmarked uh, human burials law. And um, it just so happens in the state of Louisiana, one of the assistant attorney generals is an archaeologist by training hmm. and had a, a previous life as a CRM archaeologist. Wow. And had extensive background and has an extensive background in osteology. And he's actually the, been the one pushing the protection for historic cemeteries in Louisiana. <laughs> and it, that's kind of his purview at the state. And so I guess Chip and, and he, his name is Ryan. Mm-hmm. Chip and Ryan had a pretty close working relationship. And so Chip was like, I need to meet with the um, attorney general's office and get their take on this. And so weeks went by until I finally got an email was it was basically just like Chip saying, I think it literally said, we're willing to give it a try. Is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, perfect. That's all I need. Right. And uh, <laughs> so basically, like, you know, they, they had looked at it and, you know, the assistant attorney general's office decided that it, it met legal muster. And, you know, at that point it was, it was off to the races developing a new scope of work, you know, for, for this methodology. And so we had some real technical workshop calls with the, all the archeologists involved. So myself, uh, Ben, the core archeologist, Jason Emery Mm -hmm. and Chip McGimsey. And we just got into the weeds with like all the questions that they had and what the best practices would be for this. And basically, and this is something that I had already read in the literature and kind of figured this is where we're going, is that, you know, a multi-technology survey is, is the For best sure. approach. And so, you know, they, that was basically going to be the scope that was going to be approved. So we decided we were going to employ gradiometry, ground penetrating radar, and these uh, historic human remains detection dogs. And, you know, also right. best practices using uh, multiple dogs as well yeah um so yeah at that point 
you know, it was kind of rewrite the rewrite the scope <laughs> and, and get it, get that back in. So between Paul and Ben, they were able to pull uh, two other handlers, you know, kind mm-hmm. of sort of local. When it comes to this kind of work, it's like, you know, east half of the country is like basically local. Yeah. So we uh, pulled in a couple additional handlers with, with dogs trained in archaeological applications uh, for this work and, you know, got got a, a date set. And, um, that's what we ended up rolling out with. Okay. Well, I think that's another good point to take a break because when we come back in segment three, let's talk about your results. What did you guys find? What worked? What didn't work? What did you learn? Would you do this again uh, for similar circumstances? That kinds of stuff. So we'll talk about all of that uh, if we can if we can get to all of that <laughs> in segment three on the other side. Back in a minute. Hey, fans of APN Podcasts, we've got lots of designs over at our T Public store. Every purchase helps out the APN with a few cents back to us. Check out the high-quality t-shirts, stickers, phone cases, coffee mugs, and a lot more. There are lots of colors to choose from in most of those items, and T Public often runs 30% discounts. So check out the store at arcpodnet.com slash shop. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop, and click on the link. Welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 189, and, and I am talking to Zach Overfield. We're talking about using dogs to find human remains, not just human remains, but historic human remains that may or may not even mostly be there in any physical sense, except the dogs know they're there and they can smell them. And that's what we're going to talk about. So we'll, we'll get into the, the other methods you used as well, but what was the deployment methodology of the dogs? What did this, what did this look like in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in January of this year is when we did it. So you want to do this work when it is cold. And so we got Hmm. approval on the methods in like probably October. I I would have to go back and check, but sometime in the fall of, of 2021. But the dogs, they can't work very effectively in the summer heat. They have very limited kind of amount of like up and running time in the heat. Mm -hmm. So just from a best practices standpoint, we wanted to schedule when it was cold. In South Louisiana, that's a pretty limited time of the year, but January work. Imagine. Um, And it actually ended up being a particularly cold, cold time, (laughs) especially for South Louisiana. And, you know, between Texas and Louisiana is where I do most of my work. And I wasn't even like fully prepared for the, for the cold. I had like every layer I brought with me to the project area on, but yeah, so, uh, we conducted the work in the winter. Um, we had four dogs, uh, Paul Martin of Martin archeology span consulting. His dog was equipped with a, with a GPS receiver on her vest. Oh, okay. To mark, you know, where, you know, basically the ground that she covered, like her amount of coverage and these dogs, you know, they came from different handlers, had different training experiences. So they also had different uh, alerts so mm-hmm. and, and different styles. So Paul's dog worked very much in a grid-like fashion, like transects back and forth, like what we would kind of expect for like human sure. pedestrian survey almost. Whereas Ben's group were kind of more just like free roaming. And so, you know, we had the GPS data from... Paul's dog, which was good to see kind of their coverage, but the other three dogs just kind of uh, marched to the beat of their own drum mostly. And so that was okay. interesting. And then like one dog would, would sit if they had a positive alert, another would, would bark and, and another would point. So we also had to be <laughs> familiar with what their different alerts were. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of it is still really heavily reliant on, the handler's relationship with the dog and understanding like their cues and stuff. So that sort of dog handler relationship is absolutely critical. Like you couldn't just like have any, uh, any old person, you know, work these dogs. Right. Right. You know, that was key. And so they, one of the main highlights of this work is that they can cover a lot of ground fast. So we were able to run them. The project area is pretty small, you know, like le- less than an acre. Like I said, the actual footprint of, of impacts is, extremely small but our study area yeah. itself was also less than an acre so they covered the ground really fast so we we ran them multiple times but they required like a rest between each time so it wasn't like they sure. were working all day they were we did well one we had to it, it, like i said it ended up being very cold so when we first thing when we got out there in the morning we had to actually wait a little bit and let the ground warm up because that, that's when the odor starts getting released from from the ground mm-hmm 
So it's like the best in, environment is when the ground starts to get a little warm. And so we ran all the dogs in the morning and then in the afternoon. And between that, we, we conducted our, our other methods, basically. There's also kind of one thing we weren't able to get into on this podcast is that there's other cemetery, plantation cemetery nearby called the Kenner Cemetery, oh. which factors into this pretty heavily. And so we actually, and it's also unmarked. So we took the dogs over there to establish like a baseline for their yeah. alerts. And they were incredibly enthusiastic about their alerts <laughs> on that cemetery. So we got to see them all sit, point, bark, whatever they, <laughs> whatever their designated yeah. alert was. So we got some extremely enthusiastic, uh, positive alert responses or trained r- alert responses, mm-hmm. which was key to, to kind of the results of this. And so that's what the, the dog survey itself looked like. And then... You know, the gradiometer is you know, pretty standard, like grid, you know, 10, you know, every 10 meters we had, you know, the grid laid out um, across mm-hmm. the length of the, the freight rail. We had intended to run the gradiometer between the trestles of the bridge, but I quickly realized that there's a massive amount of iron between each trestle no. and that was not going to work. Right. And then underneath the bridge... Uh, was was standing water, like I said, from the low water table. And so we actually ended up <laughs> pumping out all of the water from underneath mm-hmm. the bridge and letting it dry out a little bit to run the GPR between each trestle. So we originally dr- brought the GPR along to only target positive alert response areas if there were any. But okay. since we couldn't run the gradiometer between the trestles, we ended up pushing that GPR between each trestle. Hmm. So we could get some results. Okay. So that's basically, you know, the, the, the methodology that we ended up employing. Okay. Yeah. So, so what does this all mean? How did it all come together with the results of the, the dogs? I'm really curious too, if the dogs, especially like the free roaming ones, the things that they, if they found anything, did they all find the same things or were some of them kind of hit and miss? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we did of the four dogs, we had one that was more junior. Okay, and that and that dog certainly uh, performed a little differently than the others yeah. and wasn't yeah. as effective. That's why you have well, one you have multiple dogs so they can check each other, right? And it's also an opportunity yeah. to like get some additional training, like for the more junior dogs. So we really had like three more senior dogs, and then a fourth mm-hmm. who was like looking to get some more, you know, live action. Mm-hmm. So that standing water ended up, you know, before we pumped it out, ended up kind of already being an issue because the dogs really ended up being focused uh, on that standing water and that they, they provided multiple positive alerts on the standing water. Okay. Generally, the majority of them alerted in the same location targeting the standing water, whereas the rest of the study area, which was like a buffered area uh, away from the bridge, they, they didn't have they nearly didn't have any alerts except for an area to the south well outside of the footprint of the bridge. So basically okay. we got the, we got the gradiometer results. So, you know, we didn't draw any conclusions until we got back to the office and processed all the uh, remote sensing data. Right. Right. We got the gradiometry results and on the North side of the bridge, it was so disturbed and so much metal, you know, from the construction of the bridge is basically, you know, there was, there's no discernible anomalies. It was all noise. Right. On the South side of the bridge, there are a few anomalies that, you know, we were really looking for a pattern of anomalies that would, you know, indicate a planned, you know, union, like federal cemetery. Okay. So there were a few anomalies, you know, they all were either too small or too large to, to likely be a human burial. And there was no pattern of anomalies. Okay. And then the GPR data between each trestle didn't identify any anomalies that would indicate uh, human burials. Basically, anything that appeared in that data was like present for like one slice. And then a few, you know, <laughs> millimeters later was gone, you know. Mm-hmm. And so from the remote sensing data, it was like, oh, there doesn't seem like there's anything here. But we had these dogs alerting on the standing water. And then we had these positive alerts outside the footprint of the bridge, like to the south that weren't related to the standing water. It's like two positive alerts outside the the footprint of the bridge, but within our study area, our greater study area, the dogs were alerted on. 
So okay. the one thing, you know, to keep in mind through this whole process is that the dogs, they're really more of a presence absence tool when they're looking for remains this old because they're looking for the presence of the odor of human decomposition. And the odor can travel through the ground and basically like rises up like where it has access. So the, the fact that the dogs were alerting on this standing water really indicates that the odor is is being brought in by this water, like due to the water table. And since they weren't alerting really adjacent, you know, to the bridge or in spots where there wasn't standing water, it seemed like the alerts that we were getting from them at the standing water, you know, it wasn't quite straightforward that, you mm-hmm. know, yes, they're, they're alerting at the bridge. But then we had these other locations, you know, beyond the standing water where they were also alerting beyond the footprint of the bridge. So what we think is happening here is that, A, you know, there could be contamination from the Kenner Cemetery, uh, which is the other plantation cemetery that is bringing the odor in the water table all the way to our project area. It's not far away, you know, several, several hundred feet. So it's a little far away to think. Sure. That that much of a indication is was coming up in the study area, but certainly yeah. not out of the realm of of possibility, um, with the way that the odor travels. But what I think is more likely the case is that the cemetery is n- nearby, and that you know the historical account, you know, while seemingly initially pretty flimsy, is fairly accurate, and that hmm. where the dogs are alerting beyond just south of the study area is probably more closely like indicative of like where the burials are and that huh. we really can't take into account the, the alerts at, at the standing water. So basically what they've, the dogs have told us is there is the scent of human decomposition in this area, yeah. but with a combination of the gradiometry and the GPR and the positive alerts outside of our footprint, our conclusion was that they're not within the footprint of this bridge and that they're not going to be impacted by the driving of the piles, but that, you know, we also recommended if there's any additional work to the south of this bridge, that additional, you know, remote sensing or, or survey, you know, would be warranted. Sure. So I think is happening, you know, kind of where I'm leaning is that this Union Cemetery is nearby, but it's south of our study area and the Army Corps and the Division of Archaeology, who were on site during the fieldwork, by the way. Mm-hmm. They came out wow. to see this happen, <laughs> including Chip, the state archaeologist. Yeah. They agreed. And the other thing we factored in is like these positive alerts underneath the bridge at the standing water were, were very weak, especially in comparison to the baseline that we established at the at the Kenner Cemetery, where we positively knew the location of an unmarked, you know, historic cemetery. Right. Uh, you know, not much different in age as well. And so at these standing water getting, getting weak hits, we have these hits to the South of the study area. And then our other two, you know, tech, you know, lines of evidence that we were employed, just really entirely negative, you know, for, for what we were looking for, you know, we felt confident that we could at least say that the pilings, you know, weren't going to be driven through any burials. And that was really the question that we were trying to answer. So, so in the end, the project was able to, I guess, move on. Yeah. Yep. So the court approved of the results, division of archaeology approved of the results. And so from an environmental standpoint and cultural resources, yeah, the projects received all the clearances and and permits that it needed and it's, it'll be marching on. Okay. All right. So does this, I mean, I know, okay, I've worked in archaeology a long time and it just happens that the very first, well, I guess the second project I ever did, I almost don't count the first one because it was North Dakota and shut down by a snowstorm like a week after I started. (laughs) But my my second project in archaeology lasted about seven months and it was in downtown Miami, across from the Miami Circle. For anybody that heard about that, it's it was related to the Miami Circle, but different. And it was full of human remains. They were these limestone solution holes and human remains in there. And my wife actually is an archaeologist as well. And she worked in her early days on a cemetery project in New Jersey. But to be honest, since then, we've rarely worked on any like cemetery related or burial related projects. They just, I don't know, maybe we just moving West. They just, they just didn't come up that often. So I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, in your area and working with HDR and 
in, in your area of work, how often do you think you come across or are you having to deal with historic cemeteries or even prehistoric burials for that matter? But how often are you dealing with that? And does this experience with the cadaver dogs, you know, change how you're going to approach new projects like that in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. So at my uh, previous firm, I was working almost exclusively in the city of San Antonio, which has a municipal level ordinance for archaeology. Okay. And we were, we were dealing with historic cemeteries and human burials frequently. And so okay. that's where the bulk of my cemetery investigation experience comes from. I have done uh, just one exhumation and kind of multiple survey level cemetery investigations, like delineating cemeteries and cemetery features, you know, burial shafts. Okay. And managing those kind of projects, I would say at HGR as, as a company, you know, um, across the country, like it, it has come up and we do have a couple of osteologists and bioarchaeologists as a part of our program. And we're looking for more opportunities to not only do that kind of work, but also apply th- these techniques and continue working with Paul Martin and mm-hmm. Ben, you know, where, where possible. Because we thought it was a very uh, productive professional relationship, um, and we've since this project pursued you know other work of this nature, and I think it has it certainly changed my approach for cemetery investigations. I think it's not a one size fits all approach; it's just another tool in the archaeologist tool belt, really. Sure. Because, like I said, when you're dealing with remains this old, you know, you talked about at the beginning of the podcast, like the dogs honing in on like the ashes in an urn, you know, and it's yeah. like when they're looking for the scent of human decomposition, I think you can't really expect them to pinpoint exactly where, and we're really looking for like presence or absence or like general area, you know, and that's where like the GPR comes in, right? If the dogs are able to cover a lot of ground, like much quicker and more cost effectively, but can give you an, a general area where human remains are, then you can come in with those more precise tools and really target you know, doing the GPR in like a portion of your project area rather than being like, well, we got to run remotes, you know, slower, more expensive remote sensing technologies across this whole project area. Mm -hmm. The dogs move fast and I think they can really, I think, improve like cost competitiveness um, for these sort of cemetery survey level work. Yeah. But it's really, if you're working in a cemetery that, that's marked and you already know where it is and you're just looking to like delineate burial shafts, like you wouldn't use the dogs. Right. But okay. what I, what I see more and more like in, you know, and just in like our popular headlines is, you know, unfortunately with these uh, American Indian boarding schools where they don't know, they, right. we now know that there are likely, you know, mass cemeteries at these locations, but we don't know necessarily where on the grounds they are. You know, sure. um, I could see this being a really valid technique for those applications, you know, in conjunction with other remote sensing technologies, because I think you always want it to be a multi-technology survey. I would never recommend just using the dogs, because if yeah. we had just used the dogs for this project, we would have probably ended up still having to dig up the whole bridge, you know, because <laughs> right. we did have positive alerts underneath the bridge. But we had multiple lines of evidence and we're able to kind of, you know, filter through, you know, all the information that we had to, to arrive at, like, you know, a sound conclusion that the regulatory agencies uh, concurred with. But yeah, so and but at the same time, if you have a large project area, are you going to want to run the GPR over the whole thing? You know, right. are you going to want to scrape up the whole thing? You know, right. I think in a, a lot of, you know. For this project, we were just trying to answer the question whether or not the pilings were going to be driven through burials, you know, so I think it was kind of a, and we could answer that question solidly, but I do think a lot of these cases, like if you're, you know, they could lead to, you know, scrape, you know, scraping, but we also have a lot of, you know, projects where Native American tribes may not want you to do any scraping. You know, this is a totally non-invasive, non-destructive technique. And if the goal mm-hmm. is avoidance to just not impact human burials, this can, you know, direct you, you know, provide direction on how right. to, to avoid these features. For sure. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, in my research, it seems like this has had pretty minimal CRM application. And certainly this was a first in Louisiana. Okay. But, you know, it seems like this has been being done in academia for like maybe the last decade or so. Um, and I said, you know, in the state of Texas, I know TxDOT has has worked with Ben to, to do this work. And, 
Yeah, I think the company you were talking about, California, was that ICF maybe? I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I read a lot of their literature because it was a, a couple right. of folks, one or two folks from there. Like one of the most recent papers that came out last year on this topic had an ICF author. So I, I think, you know, we're starting to see, I mean, I think this is kind of going to be a snowball effect. We'll start to see more and more of this. And the fact that the state of Louisiana has approved this for CRM work. I've also learned that since this project, the state and chip have already recommended to other consultants to employ this methodology. So, so that just leads me to one last question. I know we're running over on this segment, uh, running a little long on it, but I've got to ask, you know, on the Archaeotech podcast, we talk a lot about different technologies. We, we've hammered on about how we don't really want to call, like we're, Paul and I are really into like digital recording methods and things like that. And we're tired of calling stuff like that digital archaeology because all archaeology is basically digital archaeology and should be. So we're kind of yeah. starting to drop that kind of thing. But but even so, like even just a few years ago, we talk about, say, drones, and it was somewhat of, somewhat of a novel concept for a, a CRM company to own drones and, and let alone have people you know, have their FAA certifications to fly the drones commercially, right? So mm-hmm. their Part 107 uh, license. My question is, do you think, now it's early days on this, but a company like HDR, who works across the nation, has offices all over the place, does projects in, in a lot of different areas, do you think HDR might have a cadaver dog team at some point that maybe flies around the country? Because I couldn't see a local office necessarily having one unless you had a lot of work. But, no. you know, maybe having a team. <laughs> I absolutely hope so. I absolutely yeah. hope so. That, that's a, certainly an, a strong interest of mine. And, you know, I, I think, you know, hopefully it's HDR. But if, if not, I think we'll see, uh, you know, definitely firms go that way. And again, it'd be, pro- you know, it'd be probably part of the, we have a pretty extensive remote uh, sensing team, just like outside of like cultural resources, like HDR is like flying drones to record, you know, bridges and making 3D models, you know, high precision 3D models of bridges for bridge inspections. That's one that we didn't even get into. We, we also had a drone out on this project. We got current aerial imagery via drone to incorporate into yeah. our project so we could look at the modern landscape and how it's been impacted by the sand mining activities and like what doesn't show up in like the Google Earth imagery or historic aerials. You know, um, you, we've got a, a lot better visibility by flying a drone out there. And we also played around with, with different imaging, you know, technologies. And we actually just... During this process, we inadvertently um, identified the, the exact location of a sugarcane mill um, in the spillway <laughs> that the, nice. uh, the Division of Archaeology had had mismapped. You know, it's just old, outdated, you know, location yeah. information, right? And we were we were able to identify we identified it, and we got you know G, you know highly accurate GPS points and aerial imagery on it, and we, we weren't even out there to do that. <laughs> so, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, there that you was go. actually pretty cool. And I wish we uh, could have looked more into that site, but it was way outside of the project area. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, see, that's what I'm talking about, right? Like drones are practically standard these days like you're yeah. you're kind of not doing your job if you don't do that at this point and <laughs> maybe not quite there yet yeah. but it, it's becoming <laughs> a, a more you know just accepted part of the uh the methodology so it, yeah. it'd be nice to see yeah it'd be nice to see these other techniques like using the dogs and things like that in, in those areas uh definitely come up i've always thought too you know my wife and i travel around the country quite a bit just before we lived in an rv and as archaeologist and you know I'm just like, man, there's been so many people that have lived on this soil, but it's still such a big area. But you go to some place like the southeast or the east coast where, you know, prehistorically there was, you know, still high numbers of people at certain points, but also historically just like, you know, massive amounts of people. And I'm like, how do like cadaver dogs not just go insane? Because I feel like there's human remains everywhere in some of those areas. And it's kind of amazing that there's not right. Our tendency to bury people in cemeteries is probably the only reason why. Absolutely. Well, you actually kind of bring up a good point. So you don't, you don't want to run the dogs in like a dense, more modern cemetery. Cause one, like their senses just be entirely overwhelmed. Just overloaded. Um, yeah. But two, you don't want to, it's really not good to run them in cemeteries that have modern, uh, like embalming techniques right. because like formaldehyde and those uh-huh. chemicals can be da- damaging to the dog's olfactory system. So, okay. 
there's actually one of the handlers relayed an account, an unfortunate account to me that because they do a lot of like POW work mm-hmm. and they had a, a, a dog who located a crash and like the human remains uh, from a, a, a military crash and that there were, you know, toxic chemicals oh, as geez. a result of the crash in the plane and the, the dog, the dog, you know, did its job, found the remains, but ultimately d- developed cancer and died. Oh my God. From, from the exposure. Um, so they're really, you definitely have to be really cognizant of the dog's like health and safety. That's, a, you know, talk about like time, you know, time of year you're running them, time of day. So there's those factors to consider, you know, we wouldn't run the dogs in August in, in the state of Texas, you know. So someday we'll and, take those uh, considerations into field techs as well, but that's probably way in the yeah, future. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. I think we, t- I definitely, you know, I think we definitely considered the safety of these dogs, you know, way more than the, than field technician safety gets, gets considered by, by clients and agencies. Right. <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah. Cause I don't think anyone's ever suggested in the state of Texas, like, oh yeah, we shouldn't do the survey cause it's August and you know, uh, yeah, but, Let's carry a few extra uh, liters of water and let's get to it. Well, you know, yeah. with you know, with climate change and the the Earth heating up, and this probably being mm-hmm. the coolest coolest summer of the rest of our lives, and um, <laughs> right, and this being like the hottest ever on record in the state of Texas, um, and with you know, unfortunately, I'm sure you probably saw on the news that an archaeological technician died in northern oh, yeah. Louisiana recently. Yeah, we talked about um, her. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, I wouldn't, you know, in the north, you know, there's a, you know, more of a field season. You know, get a certain point where it, it snows and freezes, like you just can't you know, effectively yeah. do field work. Right. I, I imagine a future in the South where we do get to that point where it's just like, we can't work during certain parts of the year. It's For sure. Too hot. Your, your field so. season is September to May rather exactly. than all year long. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. we'll be, instead of moving people from the North to the South to do work in the winter, we'll be doing, we'll be doing both or I'll be trading. I mean, folks. I, I knew archaeologists were destined for a seasonal round at some point where they're just like constantly north to south, north to south, following the seasons, yeah. following the digs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, Zach. Well, that's about all the time we have. In fact, we're well over time, but this has been a really <laughs> awesome, uh, yeah, awesome discussion. And I hope people take something out of this because there are, you know, as you mentioned, you work with people in Texas and well, in Louisiana. And I mentioned the company out of California. I'm willing to bet there are. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't say a number of other companies, but definitely other organizations that are doing this around the country. And if you think you may have human remains on your project or, or it's been rumored or suspected or something like that, this is definitely a, a, an effective, cost effective solution. And, and anytime you can do non-destructive archaeology, that is kind of the dream and the goal. Um, excavation should be the last the last thing you do, you know, just in case something needs to be preserved or something like that. But also it's it's expensive and takes a long time and, and it's just, you know, resource intensive. So if we can avoid doing that, but still get the same results, then I'm all for it. So thank you very much for coming on and, uh, and talking about this. Oh, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate you having, appreciate you having me. Uh, it was a joy. So awesome. Hope to, hope to be in touch again soon. Awesome. Sounds good. And thanks again to HDR for bringing this up to us and for your client for letting you speak about it too, because uh, that's also a rare circumstance where a client's like, yeah, go ahead, talk about it. <laughs> Most of them are, here's the NDA. Don't ever speak of this again. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd like to take a moment, you know, to sure. acknowledge, you know, C- Canadian National and specifically uh, Carrie Harris and, and Ray Baker, who were a big supporters of this. Um, but also, you know, Martin Archaeology Consulting and uh, K9 First Detection. And so Paul Martin, Ben Alexander, and then Lisa Higgins and Karen Parkett are the other handlers I worked with. And uh, their dogs, Abby, Rip, Penny, and Polly. There you go. Love it. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Zach. And uh, to our listeners, Paul should be back here soon. I don't know if he'll be back on the next recording because he's gone for like six weeks, but we'll figure something out. But either way, thanks for listening. If you've got any topics or anything else you would like us to cover or interesting people we should interview, then send it my way. Chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks for that. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Architect Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash Archaeotech. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at archpodnet.com slash members. 
The music is a song called Off Road and is license free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Please consider leaving a review on your favorite podcasting app. You could also consider becoming a member so we can keep content like this free and available to all. Check out pricing and info at archpodnet.com slash members. Thanks again and have a great day.